Java Beans, which sort of has a layer of code that is meant to hook an object to a database, or even an object-oriented database. Well, all of these are topics into themselves, and we're going we're gonna to take the simple way out, and we're going to go for probably the most basic, simple form of persistence, which is called serialization. So what I'm going to talk about today, serialization. What we're going to talk about today is serialization. Now, any idea what that word means, serialization? Well, even if you have no idea, when you add isation on a word, all right, it means to make something serial. All right? You know, if you say, you know, I don't know, mechanization. Mechanization makes things mechanical. Well, serialization makes things serial. Well, what does serial mean? What does the word serial mean? Not Captain Crunch, all right? Different serial. That, that, that reminds me of one of my favorite bad jokes. Did you hear that Captain Crunch was murdered? He's a serial killer. <laughs> all right. I didn't say it was a good joke. I said it was a favorite joke. That, that could be two different things. So what does the word serial mean? I remember dad, my dad telling me about back in the old days where they would have at movies that have serials. All right? And what was, yeah, go ahead. Okay, very good. I'm glad dictionary.com is getting his business or Wikipedia. Yeah, it means, it means like in a line, in order, in sequence. All right, if you think a serial number on a check is a sequence number in, on a check, right? Uh, you know, serial number for a car is a number assigned, you know, one, two, three, four, and so on. And like I guess back in the old days, the movies would have serials and it'd always be a cliffhanger. You know, the, the hero would always be dangling from a rope over a cliff with a mouse chewing on it at the end. And then you'd have to come in next week to see how, how he, he got out of the mess. All right. So when we think of serial, we think of like taking and having things go one after another. Well, what does this have to do with this? And, and this has to do with, with computers. What is the difference, for example, between a serial and a parallel port? Any ideas? Well, serial port, as this implies, is puts the things in a sequence, puts the, the bits in a sequence. So, and this is, believe me, this is a vast oversimplification. I'm going to, you know, make sure Huffman doesn't walk by because he'll probably come by and, and, you know, tell me the 15 ways that I simplified it too much. But I think it will suit our, purpose, suit our purpose. Let's say we have a byte and a byte of data, eight bits of data, eight ones or zeros. All right, so let's say our byte is this pattern of bits. All right. If we talked about a, a parallel port, all right, all eight of those bits would be transmitted at the same time. And then the next byte, and the next byte, and the next byte. So they'd send, in parallel, you'd send all the bits at once. All right? A serial port would send the bits down like a pipeline. All right? Another way to say it is it more or less makes it like a stream. You have a stream of bits that are going out somewhere on a network. Now, what does this have to do with serialization? Well, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll expand on that um, in, a, in a second here. Let me, let me describe what serialization in Java is. You can think of serializing uh, an object in Java like um, freeze drying it or dehydrating it. All right, would be a good metaphor. You know, why do we, you know, why can we buy, you know, um, you know, we can buy powdered iced tea at the store that makes, you know, 90 gallons worth of tea and it's a little jar about this big. All right. 
Why is it maybe cheaper to buy that than to buy like a 90 gallon jug? <laughs> All right. Well, it's easier to transport, right? If they have a truck, they can put a bunch of these little things in there, right? That was a whole innovation of Pringles, by the way, right? Potato chips, you know, they don't cost nothing to make. They cost a lot to transport because they're in a bag about this big that is 90% air, right? So the idea of Pringles, like, oh, I'll make this efficient. But anyhow, um, so if you think about it, what they do with the iced tea is to make things easier to transport or to transfer, they, they take it and more or less, you know, dehydrate it, draw it, out, you know, draw it out into its essence, and then at the other end you can go and reconstitute it, all right? And you can, you can add the water back to it and you can reconstitute it. Serialization is similar to this. We can serialize a, a, an object for a couple reasons. Reason number one is we can then save the object to disk or, or whatever. So we can go and we can save some information to disk and then we can bring it back later and bring that object to life. If you think about it, um, if, you know, an object consists of a bunch of stuff, right? It consists of properties and methods and, and, and so on, right? Well, really, if, I, if we're thinking about storing them, do I have to store the methods? Not really, because the methods are the same for every object of that class. So I can probably get by by storing only a part of the data. And again, but then to work with it again as an object, I have to deserialize it. I have to bring it back to life. All right. So one reason that we do that is so that we can store it. So and that, that's the, the, the simple example that we're going to give today is going to be about storing an object um, and then recalling it. And then maybe, maybe we'll do some variations of it depending on how the time goes. The other thing is if you're passing data, if you're passing an object, through a network to another machine. All right. Um, data to, for example, an application server or from an application server. Um, the kind of code we've been running has been code that runs on one machine, right? It's possible for efficiencies and for other reasons that you can, again, that you can have your Java virtual machine communicating with another's Java virtual machine. All right? And you need to pass information back and forth. You need to pass data to the other machine, and you need to get data back uh, from the machine. Well, how are you going to pass an object? What does an object look like? Well, you kind of have to, quote, serialize it. Turn that object into just a string of bytes that you can, or bits and bytes that you can very easily transfer over a network to another machine and get the answer back. And then at both ends, you reconstitute it, right? Just like with the iced tea. You got the powder, you know, you have the, the 90 gallons of iced tea, you boil it down to a powder, you transmit it, and then you reconstitute it again. The only thing is with objects, you can do that multiple times. And, and you know, you transmit the serialized version, uh, or you pass the serialized version between machines. And at each end, it reconstitutes it into the full-blown object. So that is known as serialization. So it's good for several purposes. Um, the, the, the most basic purpose and the purpose that we're going to explore is to take and make, it per, make an object persistent, to store it. You know? If you think about it, you know, I mean, we've, we've written schedule classes and student classes. You know, every day, someone doesn't go in and create you know, 18,000 student objects here at LC, and then when they shut down the machine, they, they create them again the next morning, right? There's some persistence to them, all right? The data from them is put somewhere so it can be retrieved uh, whenever it's needed. And so again, we're going to do a similar thing here. Now, any questions about that, the, the concept of serialization? Um, how is serialization accomplished? There is an interface that we implement that handles serialization, that makes an object serialized. Let me pull up the Java docs for that. Oops. 
Java interface, serializable, and effectively, remember, just to review, what does it mean when we say an interface? It means that any class that wants to implement this interface has to provide two, or, or well, in this particular case, two methods. I'm, 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 but in a more general sense, it has to supply all the methods that are defined in the interface. In this particular case, the two um, methods that have to be uh, um, implemented are write object and read object. with those signatures. All right. So, let's go in and let's pull down. I, I posted a bit earlier today a serialization example. And let's go and take a look at it and see how it works. If you ever download any of these and you see files that begin with underscore, again, they're, they're just um, sort of leftover files from, from the Mac that I use. So you can ignore those. I'm going to go and I'm going to copy these classes to my Java folder. And I have two classes here, and I call it a person class. You know, maybe you're registering your computer, and, and you know you want to put your name information, and then you want to pull it back up again. So you know, you could think of this as being like a control file maintenance or something, something along those lines. All right, let me go compile this, and we'll run it first, just so that you get a sense of how it behaves, and then we'll actually look at the code to see how it works. All right, there I am compiling it. Now I'll run it. All right, before I run it, notice what I have. I have a person GUI Java that compiled to a person GUI class. I have a person Java that compiled to a person class. I then have three person GUI dollar sign something or others. What are those? What do you suppose those are? We saw this before where there were dollar signs in the class name and there were no Java files. What are these guys? Not really interfaces. Um, these are inner classes, internal classes. They're internal to what? Internal to person GUI, because that's the name that's in front of it. And more than likely, because we're talking about a GUI here, and if especially if you look at the name, save, retrieve, and clear, those correspond to three different buttons. So these are the action listeners for for three different buttons. These are the event handling code for, for the three different buttons. So I, I, I coded all of these using uh, an internal class. Remember that uh, we, we talked in our very first example, our GUI class was its own 
action listener. Um, we then went and used either an internal class or an anonymous class to be uh, the, the, the action listener for components of the form. In this case, we can by deduction determine that I used um, internal classes for those three. So let's run this and I have a GUI that has a name, email, and phone number. All right. So I can go type in Mike. Then I can click save. All right. Then I can clear the form and I can hit retrieve and it retrieves it back up. Or when I go in at the next time, if I hit retrieve, it brings it up. Now, um, I'm not saying this is the best design for uh, a form like this. You know, a form like this, probably you shouldn't have to click retrieve to retrieve the data. It should already come up populated, especially in a case like this where there's only one person's worth of information that it's, it's holding, so it's not like it's asking you for, for that. But again, um, this is used, I think, to demonstrate a couple different things. All right. Now, let's look out here. Let's do a directory listing. Notice what we have. We have a file called person.ser. All right. Now, what do you suppose is in that? Well, that's that person object that has been serialized. Now, again, person.ser is a name I created. Um, I could, for example, if I wanted to enhance this to um, allow for more than being able to store more than one person, I could maybe have an ID number. And when you clicked ID retrieve, it looked for a file that had that ID number as the name of the file. And then pull up data from that file. That would actually be a nice little exercise to do. All right. Um, do you have your hand up? Question? Um, with the serializing thing, do you have to have one of those files for every time you save something? Or could you save something in the array? Like a file can contain an entire object. If that object contains an array, then, then that file will contain an array. Let's look at the contents of this and let's open it up in Notepad, just for laughs. And we're seeing, obviously, that it's stored in some sort of compressed or encrypted or whatever manner, because we, we obviously can't see my name or anything in there. But know that that, in fact, is. Um, the data, all right, in there. All right, so let's look at the code. I'm going to start out, and I'm going to look, first of all, at the GUI, all right, because um, this should be a nice little review for the GUI. Again, the other goofy thing about this is the way that it opens up. So I'll go and save this, and I'll open up person in WordPad and also save it. I want to open up the GUI first. All right. Here we go. I, I am uh, importing a, the, 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 the different uh, packages that I need. Um, I create my GUI window, which extends the, the J frame. And there's all the components on it. My main creates an instance of itself, pretty standard. I then go in and add to the different panels. All right. I add to P1 the label for the name and the text for the name, P2 the label for the email and the text for the email, P3, P4, all right, being the buttons. Then I go in and I assign the action listeners. BTN save add action listener, new save. 
Now, what is, new, what is save? Well, save is one of those internal classes that I created. All right. Again, notice that these internal classes, that last curly bracket at the very end, corresponds to the start of the class way up here. So this is an inner class, all right, because it's, def it's defined entirely within that GUI class. And as we know, it has to implement action listener. Right? For it to be an action listener, it has to implement an action listener. What does that mean? It means that it, means that it needs, all right, it needs to have this method. It needs to have this method. This is the code that it's going to do when I save it. This is the code that it's going to do when I retrieve it. Those are probably the more interesting two. Uh, uh, two. The clear simply goes in and clears out the text boxes. Um, Jacob Nielsen, a famous usability guru, would say, you know, clear buttons on forms are generally not a good idea, right? Because people accidentally hit them. All right, I talked about that in my web development class, how, uh, you know, if you go to search for a schedule here on LC's website, the bigger of the two buttons is to clear the form. And the first of the two buttons is to clear the form. So you re if you're not really paying attention, you're going to end up entering in all your parameters to search for a class and then clearing the data, swearing for a minute, and then going in and re-entering it again. All right. So. I want to spend a minute talking about the layout. This is using a box layout based on the y-axis. That means that the controls on the page are going to be oriented vertically. So, using it with the y-axis, again, you know, from algebra, the x and y-axis, that means that the controls are going to be stacked on top of each other this way. Let's see what controls I am actually adding to my um, content pane. I have actually four, I'm sorry, five panels. All right. I have P, which is my main panel. All right. And then P1 through P4. I'm adding to P1 the label for the name and the text for the name. That means that P1 contains, again, by default, since we didn't specify an orientation for it, it's going to be oriented horizontally. So P is going to contain the label for name and the text box for name. P2 is going to contain the label for email and the text box for email. P3 is going to contain the label for phone and the text box for phone. And then finally, P4 is going to contain the three buttons. So that's what this code does. It goes and adds those controls. Because there's no layout defined for um, P1, 2, or 3, by default, it's just going to put them next to each other horizontally in a line. All right? Then I go in. I define my action listers for my three buttons. I set the layout of the main panel. And then I add P1, P2, P3, and P4. What's the effect of that? Well, what's P1? P1 looks like this. I put that up here. And what do I get? I get on my main panel the name and the text box. Likewise, the email and the text box, the phone and the text box, and then lastly, the panel with the three buttons on it. So that's why, if we look at this, it looks like that. Looks Well, it looks like that. <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose, but yeah, it looks like that. The three panels are stacked vertically, or I'm sorry, the four panels are stacked vertically within the bigger panel. The bigger panel is the whole thing. This is P1, this is P2, P3, and P4. 
the stuff in P1 is oriented horizontally because we didn't do anything with the layout. Likewise, P2, P3, and P4. The, pan the sub panels within the bigger panels are stacked vertically because we've gone and we've defined a, a vertical uh, layout for that. All right, questions at this point. This is largely review of um, what we've done in previous classes because we haven't really done any of the serializing yet. All right, let's jump to the person class for a minute and then we'll jump back to this class. Let's go and let's open the person class. All right. And we implement the serializable. And I think I may have misspoke before because I don't see those methods being implemented. I misread it. Classes that require special handling have to implement these. I guess if you if you just uh, if if you uh, just um, uh, use a default, then you don't have to implement those methods. It doesn't have any. I'm sorry, it doesn't have any methods that you have to implement. All right. You can, however, override these two methods. Okay. So I misread that. Classes that require special handling during specializa uh, serialization and deserialization must implement these special methods. Apparently the code to do that is in one of the layers up above, uh, up above those. All right. So, I stand corrected. You don't have to implement any special methods unless you want to override the behavior. And so what I have is I have my protected strings. I have my um, constructor that accepts three arguments. I have additional set names and get names and gets for and sets for the other three. Um, the other three, uh, or the other two attributes. Now, the GUI, what it does is I can go and I can create the person class. This is the save one. I do a couple of things to sort of clear out the, the file um, stream that I'm going to output to. I create I create two things, a file output stream and an object output stream. Think of it like this. Here's our heap. Here is our disk. The object output stream And the file output stream sort of form the pipeline to take an object that is uh, on the heap ser and take the serialized version of it and write it as a file out on disk. 
All right. So I create one of each of these, or actually I null them out. I declare them and, and null them out. I then create a file to create a new output stream. So I'm creating a file for output called person ser. Now, it doesn't have to be person.ser, right? I chose just by convention to end it in ser to indicate it's serialized. I picked person because in this particular example, all I wanted to do was pull up one person. All this stores is one person. It's, the assumption is it's like the owner or, or whatever. All right. So this is going to be the pipeline to the file. This is going to be the pipeline from the object. And then I go and I say, all right, write that object and I pass it P. What is P? P is a person object. Why can I put p in this function? Because this function expects something that implements the serializable interface. All right. So this is, is just waiting for the code that um, this takes the serializable interface uh, or an object of, uh, that, is, that implements the serializable interface and outputs um, the contents of it, the serialized contents of it, to the file that we named. All right. This is sort of the pipeline to the uh, physical disk, to the file. This is a, a pipeline from the object to the physical file, and this actually takes the specific object that we want to um, output and outputs it to the disk file. I have this in a try catch because obviously this is a, a risky thing, right? Because we are, um, you know, we don't know, you know, is the disk full, for example? Um, is that a legal file name? Now, in this case, we hard coded person.ser, but if we were to change that to maybe allow the user to type in the file name, is it a legal file name? Does it include asterisk or some other character that you're not allowed to have? So this is definitely the case of sort of a risky proposition here that we're going to go and wrap that in a try catch block. Retrieve works just about the opposite. We have our input stream for the file, an input stream for the object, and again, that's just like these, except work in the other direction. We want to grab the contents of the file sort of pipe it through this object input stream and bring it back to life, reconstitute it as an object. And we do the same thing here. We do a try and we um, get uh, um, the try is wrapped around creating the, the file stream. We're pulling it from the same file that we, um, that we outputted. We have uh, an input stream, and then we read the object from that object input stream. That object input stream, of course, is connected to the file input stream, which is effectively taking that file, bringing it back as an object, but because it could be bring it back as any serializable object, we have to cast it as a person. All right? And that's what the parentheses person means. Once we've done that, then, we have a person object with the attributes um, in, you know, already set for us, already defined based on what we had before. And I can then go in and you know, pop those things out to uh, the respective text boxes. Questions on this? Pretty straightforward. Uh, yes? You serialize objects. All right, so a, a program is not an object, so no, you wouldn't serialize it. Yeah. Um, 
Well, kind of. All right. If, for example, the person object contained another object, maybe there was an automobile object that they had, when you serialized, you'd serialize the whole thing. All right, you'd serialize both of those. That's a good question. Let's go and do that real quick. Let's make a Let's real quick go and add a person object to the person class. So I'm adding to the person class a instance variable also of type person for their spouse, right? A person has person can have a spouse and that spouse uh, presumably is a person. All right, insert your own joke here. All right. So it is completely legal to do that. I'm going to go in and I'm going to go and add a um, argument for person with an argument of spouse. Then I'm going to get my get spouse. So return a person. I'm going to compile just to make sure, okay, I haven't made any typos. Now I'm going to change my interface to add another panel. Another label. And just to keep things simple, I will only record the spouse's name. I won't record the spouse's um, I won't record the spouse's um, email address or phone. For good measure, I'm going to add another constructor here that just accepts the name. and defaults the other two to null.
Okay. That I broke that because it, it now has a. Uh, I changed the constructor. So let's go in and let's add this guy to our other panel. Let's add that panel to our big panel. Let's change the construction, constructor rather, call here to say person s equals new person and we'll pass it the spouse's name. We'll change this one to pass the spouse to there. And that we should be okay. This one we will do, 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 do. Now I'm probably going to have to clear out that file because I've changed the person class, right? And one thing you do have to be careful for when serializing is the versioning of it. Because again, now there's like extra stuff in the person class that wasn't there before. So I'm thinking there's going to be an issue if we try to do that. Yes? Yes, I want that to be text spouse. All right, let's run this, make sure it works. All right, so we can go in and we can say Romeo, spouse's name, Juliet. We can save it. All right, we can go back and retrieve it and we see that Romeo is associated with Juliet. So what did we show there? All right, We showed there that if there's um, if some of the attributes within a serializable class themselves are, are objects, all right, they get serialized along too. So again, so array, you know, the question was asked about like an array before. So if it contains an array list, which is a class, yeah that gets serialized with it. If it contains other classes, that will get serialized along with it. Yes? Um, that is a good question. Actually, what did that, the reason I didn't, you're right, the reason I didn't get any grief is I didn't click retrieve as soon as I went in there. I went in and, and entered it in and saved it and this line of code here that that effectively wipes out the file and starts anew. So if I would have gone in and clicked, um, yeah, retrieve right off the bat, it probably would have given me grief. Yes. Right shrunk it? I'm thinking that you run the risk of, of issues uh, with if you change anything about the, about the class, about, especially about the class's attributes. You know, if you change maybe, if you just change the code you should be okay, but if you add attributes I'm thinking that that will cause a grief. Um, let's do a quick Google search on that, see if we can find something.
potentializes version. Reading is different than the version it wrote at. Compatibility change. All right. They talk about a little bit about the steps that you need to take. All right, here's a, a list of incompatible changes. If you delete a field, you're in trouble. If you move a class up or down a hierarchy, you're in trouble. Changing a non-static field to static, you're in trouble. Changing declaration type of a primitive, you're in trouble. Changing the read or write method, you're in trouble. All right, so there's a list of things that you can do that will, that will mess it up. I might have been mistaken in saying that if you add something, you're in trouble. But if you delete something, apparently you're in trouble. So apparently certain changes it can handle, certain changes it can't handle. Other questions? Right. Right. All right. Uh, I will post the revision to this as well uh, because I did make a change to it. Um, well, I'm going to think about what we need to do. This is week 12, right? And we actually have three more weeks after this week. Um, so we're getting close. Um, the one, the, the, there's, there's one big topic that we need to talk about, and that is deploying your application. In other words, you've done all this great work. You know, you've, you've written the world's best rock, paper, scissors game. Now you want to go and install it somewhere. What do you do? All right. We'll talk about that. Um, what if you want to put it on the web? What if you want to put it on a desktop machine? There's all different sort of alternatives that you can do, and depending on how you want to deploy it, there's advantages and disadvantages, and there's different ways to deploy it. And we'll talk about that probably starting next time. If not next time, we'll definitely hit on it sometime next week. All right, we'll see you up in lab then.